Thank you, Theo, and thank you for having such a person as myself at an, a, a festival on electronic music. And in fact, when Theo asked me if I'd talk, I said, well, I don't know what to talk on because I don't write electronic music. And he said, without blinking, talk about that. So that's what I'm talking about. Um, so um, when I was thinking about this talk, I thought, okay, so what is electronic music? Maybe I better check up on this because I haven't thought about it for a very long time. Basically involves, from what I can see, anything that involves computers, which is completely enormous. Um, so I'm not even going to narrow it down to concert hall, electronica or new music or anything like that. Um, I'm just going to talk about why I don't write with computers other than for notation. Um, and I actually made the decision not to write electronic music in the early 2000s when it was really starting to take off in quite a big way. Um, and at the time I thought, well, I feel like I should think about this and am I going to go down this path? And I decided not to because the equipment at that time was really expensive um, and I didn't have the funds to invest in it. And it was a field that was very, very male dominated and I just didn't feel like those fights at that time. Um, and... The concerts I went to of electronic music were really unappealing. They were incredibly loud. I remember sitting at one concert and my legs were crossed and the legs of my jeans were vibrating. It was so loud. Um, and it felt very singular and isolated. People who wrote electronic music seemed to work in isolation. And I was at that point very interested and still am in collaborative work. And it just didn't appeal. And I also wasn't hearing music that excited me at that time. It all felt like a sort of faint imitation of what Stockhausen had been doing. And I thought, no, this I'm, I'm not hearing, uh, this, this doesn't speak to my world. So I really made a decision then. Oh, and the other thing was every single technology, electro, acoustic or electronic music concert I went to started late because there were technical problems. No, 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 no. <laughs> we do late well enough here. We don't, you know. Um, and I miss the sort of theatre of a concert. Um, you know, we have to concede that there is an element of theatre in a concert. And to sit and look at someone's back in one instant who was just hunched over their laptop um, making sounds, I just thought, no, 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 I've, I've, I've lost the, the humanness here and I need that kind of interaction. So I committed to acoustic music. I made a decision, that's what I'm going to do, and I'm only going to do that. Um, and I've had some... I had some revelations during COVID, as I think we all did, you know, to get divorced or whatever. <laughs> that wasn't my revelation. My revelation was that I don't write music for music. I write music for players. Um, and people said to me, why? I didn't write one note of music during COVID. And people said, why didn't you, you know, just write another, why didn't you write a string quartet or another etude? And I said, because I don't have a player to write for. I need someone to think of in my head. I need I need to know a personality. I need to be able to visualize a player. I need to imagine a venue where this might take place. I need to think about the kind of possible audience. And that's why I didn't write music, because I don't write music for notes. I write it for players. So write for someone like Dominic. I mean, what a joy. What a joy to write for someone like Dominic who's so vigorous and so highly intelligent and so deeply engaged in what he's doing. Um, I also like mistakes. I really like mistakes. found a lovely quote that said, perfection is not a worthy goal in music. I think Brian Eno said that. And it's so true. The, the mistakes are so often where the magic happens. Uh, Musician plays a wrong note and you think, oh, that kind of brought that passage alive. Or there's a dotted note instead of a, 
a straight set of notes or something goes wrong or an ensemble unravels and it works. And you can't, you can't, that is the unpredictableness of writing for players is the sort of human element of imperfection comes in, which I find immensely important. Um, and it's the element of surprise as well. I mean, when I started working with Dominic, I had no idea how the harpsichord really sounded. I mean, you can listen to recordings, uh, lovely. You're never going to get that visceral sense of, a, of a, the sound of an instrument. I write a lot for classical saxophone. It still always surprises me when I hear it live. Sometimes not for the right reasons, but if you're working with good players, for the right reasons, um, there's just nothing like a live instrument. There's a, a tangibility in it that you can feel, you know, um, and an instrument also always changes a little bit day to day. Uh, and setting to setting, no piece has ever played the same twice. That's really exciting. It always just gives you that little edge of mm, something could go really wrong. <laughs> um, I mean, I do have to add here, I'm not well informed about electronic music. I'm saying this with some nervous because Thea's there and Meryl's there and... I don't know what's going on now in electronic music. Someone did play me something the other night. Um, some new hot electronic composer, and I really didn't like it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just, yeah. Um, sorry. As you can see, my I'm, I'm very non-electronic. Hang on. Page. Yeah. So I thought what I'd talk about here is my process of composing, how I compose, how I set about writing a piece, how I compose. Um, I was talking to someone the other night and she said, this is what is interesting. So I thought, all right, great, if <laughs> people want to hear my musings. Um, because it is a, it is in many ways quite a, quite a detached process. Um, I mean, it's, when I, so I'll talk about writing for Dominic. When I started writing for Dominic, the first thing I thought about a lot was Dominic himself um, and the kind of personality he is and the way he plays and the way he relates to his instrument and how I could imagine bringing his playing in to speak into my world um, and how I could bring this instrument and this instrument that he plays that is so associated with the Baroque into to speak to 21st century Johannesburg because that's where I live and that is my world and that's what I need to speak to. Um, which doesn't mean I want the harpsichord to be like hooters and stuff or no water coming out the taps. Well, that's an interesting thought. Um, so there are also things you need to be aware of to be careful of. I mean, I recently wrote a saxophone quartet and I'm aware that one of the players can't do multiphonics. And I was made aware after I had written the first section that two of the players couldn't slap tongue. Oh, it was a bad moment. So I had to rewrite. I should have checked before. Um, so I had to rewrite the whole piece around these players. I still feel slightly annoyed about that. Um, and then do I work with those players' shortcomings or against them? So thinking about Dominic, Dominic and thinking about his refinement and his super intelligence, I decided to work against expectation and also against the expectation of the instrument. Um, so to write something very rhythmic, very almost kind of rough sounding, um, because I thought how wonderful to go to a concert of harpsichord music and Dominic comes in and he starts to play and he's so, this delicacy in his playing and then he plays this piece and everyone is just like completely taken by surprise. Yay. Um, so that's, so I spend a lot of time thinking about that. Then I usually find a brick wall and smack my head against it for at least a month. Um, and then I start then in that 
hit smacking phase, I make musical choices. And I've been writing a lot of quite scalic music recently based on scales. I find harmony a very tricky beast. Um, so, and I've also been writing a lot with octatonic scales. If for anyone who doesn't know what an octatonic scale is, it's the ancient scale. So, um, I love octatonic scales because they sound deceptive. So, it starts on F, like my piece does. Interesting. I oh, that's it. Yeah, that's where we go. No, we're not. No, we're not. It's just so mean because it just doesn't give. It just takes away all your expectations. So that's the thing. And there's a triangle, not a lot there. And it erases. I love octatonic scales. There is not one note in this piece that is not on that F octatonic scale. So I don't modulate them to anything. It's all, every single note in that piece is from that scale which I made a decision to do, to see how much I could do on one scale. Mm. And then I select sort of features of the piece. Um, a small feature that captures my imagination. So because I've been working with scales a lot, the previous piece I'd written called Eight Minute Saxophone was descending lines of saxophone, just lots and lots of descending lines. So I thought I'm tired of going down, I want to go up. Um, and then I thought to go up in small patches and then make this kind of rumble at the bottom. This sounds really quick. This was not a decision made in a day. Um, and then take it up slowly, slowly, slowly. So the whole piece builds up towards the top register and then moves its way back down again with sort of broadly. So that sounds terrible on the piano. <laughs> Slowly, slowly, slowly build it up. And that is how you make the architecture of the piece. So that then I know my architecture of the piece is the slow movement up the register. Um, and it gives you a kind of way to take the piece forward. Which doesn't mean that every note is dictated by that. The moment you start to write for form, you're writing for analysis. You should not write for analysis. Analysis is for musicologists, like the man sitting there on my right. Um, that's what musicologists do. Composers do not write for analysis. It's a very friggin' bad idea. Um, eh, Matthijs? <laughs> You can see my taste at the back thinking, shit, 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 shit. <laughs> um, hang on, page three. So I seek out that small little feature, and then once I've decided what I'm going to do with it, then I work it. And I write like 10 pages of manuscript paper of 20, of 10 pages of things to do with a five note feature or a four note, five is too many, four note feature. 10 pages of things to do until there's absolutely nothing left to do with that four note feature. And I think that's how you get through the clutter in your head because then you become on this one little thing that there's no space for anything else. And then the piece almost writes itself because then it suddenly opens out. Um, Maybe it's a sort of mental cocaine, but you, you just kind of sharpen your mind so much into one thing that you can't think of anything else. I haven't taken a lot of cocaine, in case you're wondering. Um, it's also very important to note here that boundaries are really important. And actually, I learned this in a, music, in a lecture on electronic music by an electronic music composer who said, the most important thing when you write an electronic piece is deciding what not to do because there are so many options that you will just disappear into this 
into the thousands and thousands and thousands of possibilities. So you have to make boundaries of what you're going to focus on um, and what you're going to do. And you make that decision and you stick with it. And I thought that's really important. So I focus, and I, this piece focuses, this half to court piece focuses on Tambra um, very much and register. And those are the two things that really that I really, really focus on. And then I don't stress myself about other things like harmony and whatever, whatever. I can't even think what the other musical parameters are now. Rhythm doesn't mean they don't feature, but it's not a focus of the writing. It's not a focus of the architecture. Mm. So then I gradually sort of build it into something workable. Ideally, at this point, I like a back and forth with performers. I recently worked with the sax quartet and there was lots of backing and forthing, which I really, really liked. Because I would send them a rough draft and they would record it and send it back to me. And then I could hear things that I hadn't heard before that didn't work, things that did. That was wonderful. But you don't always have that privilege. People are busy, whatever, whatever. So what tends to happen is you write a whole draft, work with someone. So today... Dominic presented really the first draft. I'm going to redo some things in this piece. Um, and it's really in the working for me, in the working with performers that the magic starts to happen. It just doesn't live off, it doesn't live on the page. It lives when there's a living, breathing, heart beating human being making it happen and bringing in their own worlds, their sound worlds, their lived experience, their musical experience, and those magic fingers into the work. And that's when you start to get that magic sparkle. It just doesn't, it just can't happen off the page. And this is why I like collaborating so much, because you, you making something, it becomes visceral. Music is so transient. That piece is already out of our heads that you, you heard in the concert today. But the viscerality of it is so important, and I think that's still there. It still sits in you. Um, I mean, as I mentioned after the concert, this how you, how you create articulation in the harpsichord. Um, hang on a second. Yeah, and then, you know, I, you know, a lot of composers will change pieces over and over and will rewrite their pieces continuously. I don't do that. So once I've made these adjustments to this piece, I'm going to leave it. There's got to be a full stop at some point. Um, and it's very hard to make that full stop because, of course, you always want to change it because you're always having new musical experiences and new musical ideas. Um, but I'm, I'm going to put, then I put a full stop and then the piece belongs to Dominic and whoever else wants to play it. Um, and that is really what I had to say. Um, there is a quite a fun dinner party game to play where you go around the table and you ask everyone what their alternative career would be. And it's really fun because you learn a lot about the people at the table. I once played it in one of South Africa's most high-powered academics who runs an institute and his widely published massive inter international career said that if she could do it again, she'd be a socialite. <laughs> <laughs> And my alternative career, I think, although they're all completely batshit crazy, I would be an anthropologist because I love figuring out how people work. Um, and I think that's why I love collaboration. Yes, Theo, you're standing on a mark. Yes, I am. I'm on the spot. Yes. Um, I don't want to interrupt. Yes. Which is very much like us to continue with some more questions. Mm. I have a whole bunch of. Mm. Uh, questions myself, but let's open it up to open it up mm. to the floor again. If there are any comments, any feedback, please. Um, when you just ended, you said you, you hand over your piece to the performer. Have you ever been in a situation where you thought the way that somebody interprets your piece is friendly against what you had in mind? Yes. How do you how do you actually just have to keep 
keep that to yourself. Yes. Usually, if the person has played it in a way that is very unpleasing, it's because they probably didn't enjoy the piece, and then they usually don't play it again. Mm. Thank goodness. Mm. Yes. No, and you just slink away and lick your wounds. Yeah. William? Always for the um, Kind of following up on this question about the back and forth with, with performers. I mean, sometimes performers do get really enthusiastic and they think they're giving you really good feedback. And sometimes it's not that great feedback. Um, how do you deal with that? I mean, it's not like somebody tells you, well, I think this chord should be in the piece, and then you think, well, oh, that's a really silly idea. You can't just go ahead and write it, can you? So have you ever been in that situation where somebody gives you bad toing and throwing? Yeah, I have. Um, the nice thing about getting older and being more established and getting a bigger reputation is you can say no. Um, and, and I do that now. Um, before, I, have, uh, I went through a very bad phase of just accepting what people said and trying to work with it, and it didn't work very nicely. Um, you have to figure out where your compromise line is. Yeah. Um, and w it's an intuitive thing. And once your intuition tells you where that, that line is, it's actually, it's actually much easier. You can say, no, I don't think that'll work because of whatever, whatever. Yeah, but sometimes the ideas are great. Yeah. From my side, not so much a question as a comment. Mm -hmm. I'm fascinated listening to you, and then earlier this morning, listening to Joachim, listening to Joachim Zandgren. Um, I'm fascinated by the commonalities that, 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 that composers share, mm -hmm. be it electroacoustic, primarily electroacoustic composers, or so-called analog composers, whatever, whatever term you want. I, I think. I think. We share much more than, than divides us, actually. This, you know. Next to electronic piece? <laughs> With that, uh, thank you to our audience, but most importantly, Claire, thank you so much for coming down all the way to Cape Town. It's been marvelous having you here, sharing your music, your insights. Uh, it's, it's a privilege. Thank you.